Hello, I'm Anthony Fennell from the Future Tense program on ABC Radio National. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all here to the Gallery of Modern Art in Brisbane for tonight's forum. A welcome also to those of you joining the conversation via our live webcast. This panel discussion is the final in the gallery's series of public talks held in conjunction with the current exhibition, 21st Century Art in the First Decade. And today's topic, as you've just seen, is what will the future of the 21st century hold? And in answering that question, we'll look back at some of the major changes in the first decade of this century and then use that to help us look forward. And I guess our main focus will be on technological change and how that's affecting and also likely to affect our domestic and work environments. So uh, let's get on with it and um, join me in welcoming our panellists tonight. Uh, Tim Longhurst is from uh, the Strategy and Communication Consultancy, Key Message, and Tim is an advisor to some of the world's leading brands, including Nokia, Johnson & Johnson, and Fuji Xerox. And uh, he's also a futurist. Dr. Melissa Gregg is a senior lecturer in the Department of Gender and Cultural Studies at the University of Sydney. She's got a book that's just coming out called Works Intimacy, and it's based on a three-year study of the impact of online communications technology on professional work practices. Tony Albert is a Brisbane-based artist born in North Queensland. Tony's work is currently included in Goma's 21st Century Exhibition, and the work entitled Sorry was inspired by former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd's formal apology to Indigenous Australians in 2008. And finally, Ross Dawson is a leading futurist and author, and he's the founding chairman of the global research and strategy consultancy, Future Exploration Network. Now, we'll be taking questions from the audience. Uh, so you'll notice at various stages, there'll be a couple of microphones circling around. So, you know, just hold your hand up or signal to those people if you want to, uh, if you've got a question you want to ask of any of the panel. And if you do have a, a specific question, for a panel member, please uh, make sure that you, you say that this is the question, the person, sorry, that you're directing it to. And don't forget also that you can tweet um, comments or uh, brief questions simply by using the hashtag GOMATalks. Let's get underway and kicking off the discussion, um, Ross Dawson, I might get you to start for us. Um, many of us have been using computers and the internet and, and modern communications technology since the early 90s. But it seems to me, I guess, that it's only been the last couple of, dec the last couple of uh, years, really, the sort of second part of this past decade, in which digital technology has really become all-pervasive, that we've really started to see it entering our lives and becoming almost dominant in our lives. I is that a viewpoint that you would hold? Uh, absolutely. The I think it's uh, a very interesting date to keep in mind is September 26, 2006, which is the day when Facebook opened up to the public. Before that, you had to have an EDU uh, email address. So within the last four and a half years, uh, more than half Australians over 13 have decided they want to have a Facebook account. And that, that is literally, uh, in, in four years ago, very few people had heard of Facebook at all. And this... I, th I think one of the interesting things about looking at the future is that we so quickly forget uh, what things used to be like. It becomes very natural to us to have email, to have mobile phones, to have uh, these social communication tools. Yet not that long ago, we, we survived. We lived our life without email. We lived our life without a mobile phone. It we seems impossible <laughs> to imagine, doesn't it? <laughs> but uh, the, the, you know, the, uh, good, us actually. when we were younger <laughs> and our forebears, they actually survived without these device technology. Now we accept them and this is our lives. We cannot survive without them. I mean, I, I take holidays where I go for a week without using Twitter. Um, <laughs> sometimes I've, I just heard Tony, you said he was off the net for a month. But these are extremes and uh, usually we are immersed in this uh, conversation. That is who we are. I think we are discovering our humanity, our natural desire to communicate. We have the technology and that's our expression of ourselves today. And a lot of that technology, I mean, a lot of it is really useful, but some of it is also gadgetry, isn't it? And Tim Longhurst, I mean, how do we separate the two? And, and are we really now just starting to get an idea of of what the important technology will be, what, what the trends will be for the rest of this century, or at least for the next few decades? 
I think there's trends and counter trends, and definitely the pendulum has swung too far on email. Uh, so, so I, th I got a thumbs up from Mel. Uh, I think that in terms of technology and the future, the two have unreasonably become synonyms in our culture. In fact, there are futurists in Australia who aren't as up to date on tech as Ross and myself. And I think they, have every, they are completely legitimate to describe themselves as futurists because the future is more than just technology. Personally, I blame the Jetsons and popular <laughs> science fiction for uh, basically exploring the future and putting technology at the heart of that exploration. But of course, the future is uh, uh, the future of cultures, the future of politics, the way that we treat each other and, uh, and other species. Now, you do a lot of work with business, and in the past decade, uh, we've heard much about a, a changed relationship between companies and people. The idea that in this century, it's all about building a, a trusting relationship. I mean, they're, they're the sorts of wording that we hear. Mm. Uh, how much of that is hype? How much of that is just PR spin? Well, I guess it depends which organisation, to be fair. <laughs> But, uh, but I think that ultimately what businesses want is to hold customers for as long as they can. And the way that they do that can sometimes be through providing a quality service at a reasonable price, but it's also often through a brand, through managing perceptions. It's sometimes through uh, uncertainty in terms of uh, comparing products. Has anyone ever tried to compare mobile phone bills in the last two years? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost, uh, it's near impossible to compare like for like. And also one of the ways that businesses maintain relationships with customers is by locking on 24-month contracts and, and things like that. So I don't think we've found out, arrived at a perfect consumer business relationship where it feels completely equitable and a fair exchange of value. Uh, Ross Dawson, um, we've, we've become used to hearing the word, just staying with that, that, that corporate thing, we've become used to hearing the word consumer uh, used in place of, of citizen. Uh, and, and we now, a lot of our politicians talk about about the economy uh, regularly uh, when, when they're really talking about society. In a sense, has it been this, this first decade of the 21st century where that, that, that corporate speak and almost that corporate ethos has, has got into um, you know, our, our society? It's, it's got in and, and had a, a, an incredible influence. It's, it's started to dominate. Uh, I think there's, there's two ways. One is that absolutely corporations are become the centre of our world, not the standing the sort of larger share of government and, and activities. But I, what I see is, you know, I think if you look, say, a decade ago and looked at organisations of the time and what they could become, I think we have in many ways come a long way. And looking at principles like collaboration, openness, transparency, uh, we have, we have actually vastly different organizations today than we did 10 years or 20 years ago. And I think there are many CEOs uh, today of a very significant proportion who very genuinely want to make a positive impact. And I think 20 years ago, that would be very, very hard to say that. So there is a count, each influences each other. Absolutely, it is the corporatization of society, but I think there is also the socialization of corporations is happening at a, a pretty good pace as well. I mean, it isn't uncommon, just picking up on that point, to find CEOs who do blog, who do genuinely uh, blog and, uh, and take advice. Absolutely, yeah. It's, uh, and that's part of that conversation, it's part of that responsiveness, and it is part of caring sometimes. And, and you know, part of this is the, the 60s generation who have uh, now grown up to positions of power, but now have got more and more the people who not so long ago were young and idealistic are now a little bit older and often still idealistic. Melissa Gregg, uh, your new book is all about the effect of modern communications technology on our work practices. Um, a lot of the hype around technology that we hear is about its ability to liberate us. Um, but I have to say, I've met lots of people, I know lots of people, who feel that technology, modern technology is terrific, but Yes, it liberates you in some ways, in other ways, it actually makes you feel much more trapped mm -hmm. uh, and much more beholden, if you like, to your, your corporation, the, the place where you work. Mm -hmm. What's, what did you find in the research for your book? What were the feelings of people when you, when you talked to them about their relationship with technology? Well, I, when you were speaking just then, I was thinking about what happened to me as I was writing up the findings for the, for the study and I was asked to become 
a fan of my workplace on Facebook. And it seemed to sum up a lot of the things that I was trying to uh, get my head around at the time, because obviously I, I do enjoy my, my job and I enjoy the opportunity to have that job. And I like to express that when, when I have um, the opportunity, but I don't actually like the, uh, the formula of having that encoded in a way that Facebook owns. And one of the things I suppose that stood out for me in the study was that a lot of organisations were adopting uh, particular platforms, and we have to remember that they are particular platforms that will pass. Um, we have to remember that there was MySpace, then there was Facebook, and there is the kind of this temporality that then also says that then there was Twitter. And through the study, I was watching all of these different uh, platforms being rolled out and becoming increasingly mandatory for employees in different organisations. And here I'm also talking about not just corporate uh, employees, but, but people working in, in public service um, organisations too. So what, what I found was a, a level of discomfort um, in a lot of employees who had, who had taken jobs where they assumed that they wouldn't have to have a public face they wouldn't have to perform a certain kind of company message um, as part of their job, and yet this was part of what was being, uh, I suppose, smuggled in with, with new media technologies. So uh, a, a certain discomfort also in a group of employees um, coming to the workplace uh, for, uh, for various reasons on more flexible uh, arrangements, women working part-time, for instance, who were being asked to catch up um, with these new media technologies, but in their own time, when the, so, so the structure of the jobs weren't necessarily giving them enough time to keep up with the pace of technology rollout. And that, to me, was something really interesting because we don't hear a lot about the different kinds of employees. What, what difference does it make if you are the CEO blogging as opposed to the part-time employee who's encouraged to blog uh, on the way home after picking up from their children from, from school. And that idea of intimacy, I mean, the title of your work's intimacy, uh, you know, at, at one stage, it, like, I guess on one hand, you're meant to have a very professional relationship. You're there to do a job. Mm. Uh, work is not your friend. <laughs> um, but then the discourse back to you sometimes is, as you're saying, is... Yeah. Uh, is a friendly discourse that yeah. traditionally we wouldn't have associated with with the workplace. So th that's that's the wonderful uh, contradiction is that we we are invited as employees to uh, identify with our with our jobs and to really get fulfilment out of our out of our professional lives, and yet uh, that really does make it difficult to then put boundaries on when you really do want to have a break from work and from that identity, that professional identity, how do we start to make those labour claims anymore if everyone's job is assumed to be fulfilling from the start? And there's also that idea of, of always being on. I've heard people talking about that, just the, the pressure that you can never get away. You can't, you've, your laptop goes with you, uh, your mobile phone, that kind of thing. Uh, Tony Albert, you're an artist. Um, we know that technology over the last decade has made it much easier for people to be creative uh, and also to collaborate. <coughs> What's your experience in that respect? Um, I think I really liked where Tim was going with the future doesn't have to be about technology. I said earlier I spent the last month with, without a computer, without internet access. I don't use a computer every day. Um, I spent today using an overhead projector and carbon tracing paper. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the greatest skills, you know, that we have as people are those that are tangible and physical and about us um, in person. So, I mean, it's certainly the global access we have, you know, to communication and stuff through technology is, of course, amazing and um, a key to, I think, art and where art is headed in 21st century is an amazing example of this. But um, in, my, in my own life, it's quite low-tech. I'll just interrupt for a second. Somebody sent a tweet uh, along these lines. Technology doesn't have to be digital. Futurists don't have to focus on e-everything and i-stuff. A sharp rock is technology. Uh, I mean, there is that idea, isn't there, that we, we as you're saying, we do sometimes forget that uh, life can exist without this yeah. technology. But uh, to do a stereotype, you're Gen Y. I mean, your whole life <laughs> is supposed to be... <laughs> we're told, we're told, your whole life is supposed to be about technology. <laughs> wow, I don't. <laughs> uh, I mean, what about what about your friends? I mean, do you find are they like you? No, yeah, technology does play an incredible 
role in, in day-to-day life. You can't deny that. I mean, I think I was on the cusp of, I didn't grow up having a mobile phone or, you know, we had a black and white TV. So there's still, you know, elements of an old school life I, I had. But, um, yeah, it, it, you know, there is that everyone has Facebook, everyone has access to each other. Um, I don't have or know Twitter. But um, I, I think for sure that and full-time artist job is an exception, I think, to what is happening in the rest of the world in terms of daily use of technology. And in terms of, though, in terms of your ability to communicate with other people, in terms of, of getting ideas or, as I said earlier, collaboration, mm. uh, is it easier now than it has been in, in previous years from an artist's perspective? Um, uh, the accessibility of information um, is certainly... Um, key to to any artist or any any response to what is happening. I think of myself as a conceptual artist, and that response to what is happening in, in not only my life but how I fit within the world or how we all fit. Um, most certainly, um, you know, this this way of where we're headed, or the the instant access we have to things is 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 pretty amazing. To think, you know, ten even twenty years ago, we we're handwriting essays, um, and now that seems absolutely ludicrous. Uh, Ross Dawson, um, I've, I've given up looking at the technology section in The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald because I just can't keep pace with it. There, there just seems to be so much change going on. Uh, as a futurist, um, I just wonder how difficult it is uh, to, to actually keep ahead of all that, uh, to be involved in trying to forecast trends for business or organisations and and be on the money, not feel like uh, you've suddenly fallen behind the curve? There's a, in the order of 100 times more digital information today than there was 10 years ago. And so it is. Uh, I wrote an article in 1997 about information overload and uh, obviously we've got <laughs> quite a bit more now. And I, I guess this I, broadly I see that the whole idea of Web 2.0, the concept of Web 2.0 was mass participation creating value for, for everyone, and a large part of that is filtering. So I perceive that a lot of what is happening in the social web is enabling us to filter and find information far more. So yes, we have infinite information, we have far better tools to filter that through the social aggregation and tools such as you know, tech meme or Topsy and a wide variety of other tools which actually filter the information. But ultimately it's cognitive. It is about our brains and our ability to take information on. So my approach is, you know, to do visual frameworks, visual things which help to be able to make sense of what's out there and put the pieces together. And the, these are the skills which we all need is how do we make sense of rather than trying to be across more information. So these are skills which we need in schools, the skills that we need to develop as individuals. Uh, we will never be across all the information, but if we have a framework to put that in, then combined with the tools of the web and of uh, collaborative filtering, you know, I've, you know, in my book, Living Networks, I wrote collaborative filtering is the heart of the future. We are collaborating to filter that information overload, and from that, we're able to make some sense. Uh, Tim Longhurst, what's your view on the money? Is, is is filtering going to be, or learning how to filter correctly, the, the vast amount of information that comes to us, is that going to be as important for, say, this next decade as, as just understanding the, the sheer quantity of data was uh, for this past decade? Yes. So... <laughs> <coughs> Please exp Care to expand. Elaborate? <laughs> uh, I think it's about pattern recognition. You can't possibly read every article, but you can start to identify signals in the noise. Uh, our ability as humans and our ability collectively as organi organisations and communities, our ability to understand where our choices might take us, take a step back and consider the con those consequences and make active, active choices about the future is really important. So for, let's take your technical, technological example of reading the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age every day, it would be overwhelming. Well, there are some certain, focusing on tech, there are certain meta trends that are happening in that area. So for example, we've seen processing uh, capacity increase over the last, over, over years. Uh, storage capacity is increasing substantially. Uh, the uh, battery life is increasing. So basically what we can say is there's some, there's some major trends drivers for change that allow, are allowing, for example, smartphones to exist. 
And so you don't necessarily need to understand every smartphone to conceptualise the role of a smartphone. And so, um, yes, I would say that definitely having, having filters, being able to aggregate information and knowing and, and having trusted sources has become a part of how we can... I mean, no one's read the internet five times. There is, though, uh, there is a body of thought that's, that's sure. starting to develop that, that suggests that one of the outcomes of that filtering is that we're locking ourselves away. That idea of homophily, that uh, birds of a feather flock together, mm. that there's just so much stuff out there that we're retreating into our shells and we're just really engaging online as we would in the, in the real world with people that we trust and that we know. Is that a real phenomenon, do you think? Absolutely. Jordan Louvier at University of Technology, Sydney, I know Ross wants to jump in, so I'll keep this brief, right. to, uh, described it as availability bias. We're biased by the information that's immediately, immediately available to us. So if we're logging on to Facebook or Twitter, and remember, we have self-selected those people that we've decided to associate with in those networks. And so if the only people whose political ideas and philosophies we're being exposed to are the people that we you know, already choose to associate with, then we may be missing out. And in fact, we may be making the, the, the chasm or the, the, the divide between different political views even more acute. Uh, and Ross, you're jumping in, but the, uh, the companies are doing this for us as well, aren't they? I mean, they're looking at what we like and they're helping us to, to narrow our focus. Yes, I mean, this is not a new phenomenon. I mean, for ages we've bought newspapers that reflect our political views. In Australia, we haven't had, tended to have as politically aligned uh, newspapers and uh, media outlets as we do in some other countries. But, in, you know, historically, for forever, we've, been, we've read the, in the 17th century, we read the pamphlets which supported our own political views. And, or we read the, the Sun in the UK if that's aligned with our views. So, you know, that's all you read. That's all the news you had for the day. So I think that there's, there is, people can lock themselves in and say, I'm only going to look at this sector of things. But the, we have far more opportunity to stumble across other things. And there's this idea of the serendipity dial, where we can choose to have a, some, a lot of accidents and stumbling across things that we're not specifically looking for. Or we can turn that down to say, no, I'm only going to uh, want to look at things which I know I'm going to like. Uh, some people are choosing to go down that path, but I think through the information filtering we have, we probably have more diverse information than we did. Melissa or Tony, your thoughts? I just wanted to uh, agree with one of the tweets, actually, you know, that uh, we need to remember that the, the Twitterati are uh, a very small minority, and, and especially if we're also talking about the global uh, future. Um, one of the things that I do like to try and remember all the time is that the <coughs> version of the internet I understand as someone who only knows one language is the English language internet and I also know that there's only a very small proportion of people in the world that are even using the internet or even have electricity or clean water you know so I just I really agree also with uh, what Tony was saying about how we understand the future that needs to be uh, breaking free from focusing too much on the elite. Tony Albert, uh, a tweet, uh, somebody's tweeted, I think it's useful for artists to abstain from technology to drive their originality. Sure. Your thoughts on that? Um, I mean, it's, I think, a bit of a mantra for me to, yeah, to avoid um, the technology only um, because of the way in which, I mean, I work personally, but I, you know, have no plenty of artists that are at, at the forefront of, of new media and looking at technology as a new tool within art and a new way of engaging with audience. So, I mean, it's it's a complete double-edged sword, and it's I think just to be open to those options um, is um, one of the most important things. Because I would imagine that there, there, I mean, there could be a danger again in in locking yourself away. I mean, technology does it, it can be used to open up. Uh, your viewpoint. It can be used to open up experience, can't it? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, <coughs> Melissa Gregg, um, the BBC's correspondent in Australia, it's looking like I'm a school, school teacher, correct me. Um, he said, Nick, Nick Bryant, this is, the BBC's correspondent in, in Sydney, he said a couple of years ago that he was surprised uh, at how consumed by work Australians were mm -hmm. and that it didn't actually fit 
the stereotype mm. that Brits have of us and that we have of ourselves as a laconic, relaxed kind of people. Mm. In a sense, over the next couple of decades, do those, do those myths about our work life, do they need to be reinterpreted, re-explored? Re are, no uh, are they no longer relevant to really who we are? Mm. That's a really amazing question that I, I'm, glad, I'm glad somebody's asking because often I find myself wondering this uh, alone, it feels like, because I grew up thinking that this was the land of the long weekend, you know, there was that mythology that, yeah, a bunch of slackers, and especially in Queensland, I mean, you know, the weather just means that nobody works, like, these are all the international stereotypes that we carry. And yet, the workers that I interviewed were finding it so difficult to have a weekend and the people that did actually admit that they had taken leave in the last few years, that actually had booked holidays, were talking about how they had to turn around and come back again because work called them and they answered the phone. You know, and so I just wonder, what is it that's going on there? Part of it is that we're also changing the kinds of work that we do. A lot more people are working in knowledge professions, in communication professions, and my study was looking at information and communication professions and education professions, the ICE sector of the new economy. And that's really something that has changed since a lot of those mythologies about Australians uh, were developed. So we're moving from the kind of uh, Fordist to post-Fordist model or the industrial model to the post-industrial model of work. So that does change the requirements and the, the ways that we understand what commitment to work means or what professional identity means. But, but just to also remember some of those other questions about, about who's leading this or who is the dominant representation of what a worker is, um, I really wouldn't want um, my study to be reinforcing the, the dominance of one particular version of work, which is, which is largely uh, office-based and, and knowledge-intensive. That's only a very privileged uh, version of what work is available in the world these days. And in my book, I end up talking about this. The conclusion of the book is, is uh, a new distinction between uh, those workers who have the luxury of loving their job and those uh, who, as, as uh, some of you will know, who, um, who put together, for instance, as their job, uh, the bits that make up the iPad or that, that make up the keyboards. And, and in the Foxconn uh, factories, um, where, where all of that happens in China, that's uh, where the suicides were happening as I finished the book. And it seemed to me a really stark way of representing the contrast in opportunities for understanding <coughs> work and who really has the choice to work as long as they do in, in society today. Uh, now we'll take some questions. Uh, so if there are people who want to ask a, a question. Uh, just while we're getting a, a microphone to you. Um, Tony Albert, um, on that idea of imagery, uh, I mean, that's something that you deal in, isn't it? Um, <laughs> representations, the way we, we portray ourselves, the way we think of ourselves. Uh, do you think, do you see our, our national stories uh, and our, our, our mythologies, if you like, do you see them changing significantly over the next couple of decades? Um, I hope so. They have to change. <laughs> the history of this country needs to be rewritten. Um, and, um, I mean, this was interesting for me to, to think about because, as I said, I've just been without email for a month and that was through choice. I was in China and I was so sick of the... Um, restrictive nature that was put on the internet and just constantly being shut off um, from sites and um, uh, specific things that I was interested um, in researching while I was there. Um, but in that response, I sort of thought about, well, the idea of the freedom we have here, we are equally being as filtered through um, the media or who owns the media's agenda to what we read and what we see as well. So I think... Um, to it's equally as bad, but um, again, I don't have the answer, the answer to the problem, but um, I most certainly think that um, the representations of who we are as a nation needs to be looked at. Uh, and do you think people are feeling that? Do you think people are, or do you get a sense that people are starting to feel like, like the symbols that we have of who we are no longer quite fit, even if, even if they, they don't know exactly why they don't fit anymore, there's just a, a feeling that that some of that stuff is out of date. 
Um, I would or like is, to. Or is that wishful thinking? It's wishful thinking, I think. I, I would most certainly like to think that I'm an optimistic and idealist kind of person, but um, and I'd like to think there's a new wave or new generation of people coming through that have these um, ideals or beliefs. But we only have to look at something as um, relevant as the the Cronulla riots or the um, what it now means to have a Southern Cross tattooed on your body to realise that you know m maybe maybe the, the new generation um, has equal an agenda or ideal of who we are as a nation. Uh, all right, and just a quick reminder that this is the, uh, the final panel discussion in our Goma Talks Futures series here at the Gallery of Modern Art in Brisbane. The topic today is what will the future of the 21st century hold? And our guests are Dr. Melissa Gregg, Senior Lecturer in the Department of Gender and Cultural Studies at the University of Sydney, Brisbane-based artist Tony Albert, whose work is currently included in Gomez's 21st Century Exhibition, leading futurist and author Ross Dawson from the global research and strategy firm Future Exploration Network, and fellow futurist Tim Longhurst from the strategy and communication consultancy Key Message. Uh, I'm Anthony Fennell from ABC Radio National's Future Tense program. And uh, don't forget, if you're in the audience, please, if you've got a question, uh, we'd love to hear it. And also, as people have well, we've had no shortage of, of, of tweets going up. Um, if you do want to send us uh, a, a tweet, the hashtag, of course, is Goma Talks. And let's go to that question. Hi, uh, uh, Tim talked about how, how in the past brands, companies have liked to have brands where they can control the media. And if anything, the web's the great equaliser where the individual can steal customers off the Fortune 500 company. And we've seen... I think uh, cases of that with Borders recently and uh, the music industry. Are we going to see a what's going to look like an economic recession because you have all these Fortune 500 companies losing business to a whole bunch of individuals working from home or <laughs> wherever? Who wants to, who wants to pick up I'll that question? In. Yep. Yeah, there's, so, I, so, the, so key message, we advise businesses across industries and there is uniformly a conversation about the tsunami that is sweeping through almost every industry, and that is the internet. And so, uh, in short, yes, I think that there are people, their businesses are making their way as fast as they can to the higher ground. And the point that the question is making is that small businesses, perhaps home-based businesses in some instances, are actually far more ag agile and able to make it quickly to the high ground and, uh, and larger businesses are, are sometimes wondering how are we going to turn this, it takes a long time to turn this mammoth ship around. And so it's going to be interesting in a decade's time to see, uh, you know, I, I think Rosalind Kogan's Melbourne-based technology business is an interesting vignette from, the, from a potential future where you've got uh, someone, he's, I think he's 32 years old, and he's basically going to uh, Guangzhou and the same fa similar factories that Melissa talked about, and, um, and basically building his own uh, electronics business. And, and Harvey Norman is watching uh, with more than interest, with concern. Well, I, I guess just adding to that, if you think of, uh, say, Facebook or Google, um, you know, they were little back backroom operations only a few short years ago. And, and I don't know what the figures are for... Backroom of Harvard. Uh, backroom of Harvard, <laughs> sure, but still... <laughs> <laughs> but still very small, um, and I don't know what the figures are now, but I mean, Google, um, I assume, I, I think I've seen the figures that suggest that Google now has far surpassed the Murdoch empire in, in terms of profit and, and, um, and its actual value, mm. a and that's in less than a decade. It's that was a statement, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take that Tim. as a comment. Thank you. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yes, over here. Uh, there's a question for the panel. I wonder if modern technology is really dumbing us down. I look at the younger generation and there seems to be a certain superficiality. They do 1,400 things and no depth. There's a perfect illustration is that behind you there's this great big screen which has got all these questions and comments being tweeted. I find that incredibly distracting and irritating. I don't know if other people, have, well certainly my generation would probably find that. There seems to be this thing that you're not allowed to actually think deeply about anything. It's just flitting from one thing to another. And that seems to be the way you know, this modern technology in life is going. Uh, Ross, do you want to pick that yeah, up? Yeah, the, I, I think this and I think some of the other questions which we're facing are deep unknowns. 
and there is a very rich discussion on, on this topic at the moment with uh, half a dozen books out at the moment on you know, one called The Shallows, uh, basically suggesting that the world of connection is uh, leading to shallow thinking and some other, you know, other prominent uh, thinkers in that space and a lively debate on the other side of the, the question. I, I think that there, there is a, a polarization. I think that many people are allowing the easiness of tweets and, uh, and you know, it's very brief captured thinking to uh, think shallowly, to be able to just look, look in this very much respond uh, to provocations and to not look in any real depth, not, never to read anything in, in great length. But I think there are still many uh, possibly as many or possibly even more than before who are really grappling with some deep issues, trying to understand them. I think there is uh, uncertainty. I believe, I, I certainly feel that the people myself and the people I connect with uh, through technology are thinking uh, in depth about significant issues today and they're allowing the conversations globally to facilitate that. So I think there's many <laughs> strands to this. <laughs> Let me see. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that brings yeah. to an interesting point. There is, point. <laughs> there is this idea of, of the democratization of, of opinion, isn't there? That everyone can have a voice and everyone gets to have a comment. But uh, in the online environment, uh, it's easy to think of examples where those comments aren't necessarily helpful. Um, and that when you have, uh, say, meetings like this, that they actually intrude. Uh, so, in the one sense, there's this democratisation going on, but then is there a risk that we just devalue uh, the expertise that's there at the same time? But that's, what you're, that's what's implicit in the question itself, which is, which is that there is a, a higher value to depth and that... Um, that that there should be experts who are able to be discursively uh, engaged in long conversation because they're professionalised and because they have been given access to all kinds of cultural capital that the majority of people may not have. And so I just wonder whether um, our investment in depth is something that we could be a little bit more uh, reflexive about because um, there are all kinds of competencies and values that come with multiple kinds of literacy and the, the capacity to withstand a lot of stimulation that are things that we just don't even understand at this point. And so I, I really wonder whether there's any point talking about things in a generational sense because there's all, it's not the generation's fault, it's not the young people's fault that they were born after 1980 or wherever the hell the cut-off point is for Generation Y. I felt very uh, empathetic for <laughs> the question earlier about because you grew up with filtered water, does that make you feel like you were um, you know, blessed and you, weren't go you were going to refuse the benefits of the technologies available to you for your generation? You just It's not helpful for any of us to be thinking in generational terms and perhaps we can look at the opportunities that multiple forms of expertise and multiple forms of attention might offer us. The, the point of that question, I guess, was, was that we have that stereotype, that we expect that there are these generational changes. stereotypes change. are, are developed by mm. a mainstream media that is owned by baby boomer CEOs and so, you know, how could you not expect them to produce uh, ways of labelling what's happening in, in history right now? Uh, Tim, in terms of... In terms of the, the the value of comment, I know one thing that a lot of uh, a lot of online sites have struggled with mm. is is opening up a discussion online. Uh, that uh, and and there's almost been a movement back. There was this idea that you had to let all comment go and then and then filter it after that. And now people seem to be moving back to the idea that no, you don't necessarily have a right to comment unless you're furthering the debate or discussion. Do you sense that, that kind of that pullback? Uh, I, look, to be candid, I don't. I actually think that, that what, I, what I'm seeing is, is spaces being opened up for, for dialogue at every, at every opportunity. And there's a number of reasons. Commercially, there's value in having the added text on your page for, for Google to pick up search terms. And so it's in the, a, a newspaper, an online... Uh, newspapers' interest to have all of that additional content. It can serve them well in advertising, for example. So, um, in terms of, I, I mean, I'm, I'm actually intrigued by the question of uh, of attention spans, and uh, and 
a comment that I would make about attention spans is that as a, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a conference speaker and just last week the National Speakers Association had their annual conference and one of the big conversations that we were having was about the attention spans of audiences and how these days you, gen you generally need to build in almost a commercial break in your keynote uh, and, and, and break, it, break it up somehow because people really can't hold even a 45 minute presentation without some kind of uh, you know, video interlude or something, you know, a, a game to be played in the room or what have you. So it is interesting to think about portfolio careers and people managing several jobs at once. And yeah, it's, I, think it's, I think this attention span thing is an interesting uh, trend. And, and how much of that though is being driven by mm. a perception that that's what you've got to do? That, you know, that perception that, that we all do have attention spans that mm. are, are shorter now. Uh, and sure. therefore you have to do those things that you have to use new technology. Oh, look, I think, it's, I think that um, there's definitely, a, a, again, I, I return to this idea of the pendulum and trends and counter trends. One of my favourite counter trends is Pierre Roloff's in uh, Melbourne, a, a world, a, a world, one of the world's top pastry chefs. And he was finding himself working 60 hour weeks making, uh, making desserts and he thought there must be a better way. And he's, he's opened a, a, a thir on just one night a week on a Thursday night at a cafe. He rents out the cafe and he spends the rest of his working days, so four days he spends developing one-off desserts. And that one Thursday night, you can try his three desserts and he commits to never making those three desserts again. And so if you wanna try those three desserts, you've gotta be there on the Thursday night. There's a line out the door. So he has made a, a public commitment to depth and also a public commitment to innovation. So I think that's actually quite exciting and he doesn't necessarily promote his business through social networks or what have you, but he's a b beneficiary of social networks and conversations lighting up on the web. Other questions? Yes. Good evening. A question for Tim or Ross. Do you think in the manner that we debate the merits of achieving peak oil, will we at some point in the future achieve peak technology in our ability to process and adapt? Uh, Ross, maybe if you... Uh, you uh, no, I don't think we will. I think that... Uh, our <coughs> excuse me. I think that our human destiny is to merge with technology. So uh, many people will choose not to do so, but basically we are on the verge and we are beginning in various ways to uh, take that into ourselves. And th so when we're looking at the future of the 21st century, a lot of it is about the future of humanity and what humanity becomes, which could be virtually unrecognizable from what we have. Now, many people shy away in, in horror from that, but it is, I think that it is inevitable that we, and so there is not, there, in that sense, no, there isn't a peak technology. We will continue, and I think that it is human to want to do that, not to say that uh, making the other choices is not entirely valid, but yes, we will, we are, in the future, I think it's a fair guess that we will have some people who have chosen to become completely technologized and some people that choose not. In a purely practical sense, though, I mean, we, we, we do forget that all of the technology we use, all of the data, it all has to be stored somewhere. And that, uh, you know, storing all of that data means enormous, enormous service and that generates, uh, that means the generation of enormous amounts of electricity. Uh, to keep all that stuff going. Uh, is there not a point where uh, we have to ask ourselves how much of that we can, we can sustain? In the same way that we, you know, we may well have to ask ourselves fairly soon, can we sustain all of the technology, all of the electrical gadgets that we have in the house if, we're, if energy costs are going up? Well, this goes to a broader question, which is beyond what we've covered so far this evening, which is about sustainability of energy, sustainability of food, sustainability of water, sustainability of environment. And these are a broader context in which we live. We, we cannot be sure how or whether we will be able to deal with these fundamental issues. Uh, so talking to peak oil, we know that we will be shifting in terms of the energies which we'll uh, use. We don't know what that makeup of those energies will be. Uh, and that's what we're dealing with at the moment is, um, is making sense of that and hopefully being able to have uh, addressed these in ways which are create better futures for us. But we don't know that. Uh, Tony Albert, in terms of, I know you, you, I'm sure you probably wouldn't want to be a, a, a seen as a spokesperson for Indigenous Australia, 
But, it, but in terms of, of looking toward the future, do you, as an Indigenous artist, do you, in a sense, have two visions of the future? Is there a, a different vision of the future when, you, when you're thinking of your Indigenous side uh, as opposed to you in a broader sense as an Australian? Yeah, I think, well, just even the label Indigenous artist or Aboriginal artist, I'm a contemporary artist and I'm an Aboriginal person. <coughs> um, you know, I can't change the way institutions, anthropologists or whatever, choose to classify us. What I can change is the way I speak about myself. But I mean, um, I mean in terms of, I mean, the, the enormous disparity that it still exists mm -hmm. between a large section of, of, uh, of our community, the Indigenous <coughs> part of our community, as opposed to the other. I mean, um, is, is, is there a sense, uh, you know, f for Indigenous people, are there two futures out there and one, one is not necessarily as rosy as the other? I don't know. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's such a broad question. Um, well, to think about the future is a white fella question in the first place, right? I mean, it's a completely different understanding of time that you would want to project uh, that far ahead in order to understand your identity at the moment. So one of the things, I guess, uh, as a cultural theorist, I think about too is who has access to the range and capacity and language of imagining a future. And that's certainly one of the ways that, say, sociology understands inequity in society. If you even can think a day ahead or a week ahead or six months ahead in your life, if you have access to those structures, or if you have access to a salary that allows you to plan time, then you're already ahead of a lot of people in the world. So, I mean, I just, I think it's important well, to think privilege about... Privilege is yeah. what you're talking about, and it's like to be born white in this country is actually a privilege, which I think is overlooked by most white Australians. And looking ahead, do you see any change in that? Um, I mean, there's just, I think, so much that has to happen for that change to exist. Um, I mean, I look within the just the visual art section alone. We've got um, academics, curators at this institution and other institutions that are Aboriginal academics who are my heroes in life. For a long time, I think visual artists have had to take on those roles within institutions or within their selected field to have a voice or to have representation within that area. And what we have now with these, these um, younger people coming through as academics is that um, you know, they, they can focus on that and we can focus on what we want to do as visual for me to be able to go into my studio every day and do what I want and have these people um, outside of that focusing on the the, you know, how my work is represented or the writing of um, art by um, Aboriginal people. So, you know, I think th there is a hope through looking at um, a younger generation um, uh, that, that's coming through um, with those, those skills, but um, it's such a tough question and something I think about daily. I wonder if there is hope for us as um, Aboriginal people in this country. Uh, Melissa, um, your academic background is in, in gender and uh, cultural studies, cultural and gender studies. Mm -hmm. That's right. Picking up on the gender side of that, uh, all the studies I've seen uh, tend to indicate that women continue to do most of the child rearing within families. Yes. That they do most of the housework still. Yes. Uh, that they're also still paid on an average less than men. That's correct. There's fewer of them in senior corporate ranks. Slight relation. And uh, that... Um, they find it much more difficult, to, difficult re-entering the workforce yes. after a period of, of absence. Uh, and that's at the end of the first decade of the 21st century. Mm. Paint us a picture of the end of this century. How is it going to be any different? Is it going to be any different? The end of this century. <laughs> well, um, one way I could answer that would be to go back to a conversation we were having earlier about the prospect of avatar erotics and gender may not matter as a category at the end of this century. That, this is, this that is before would be the session started. Yes, we had a really interesting conversation which I bet you all wish you heard now. Gender itself is a category that's come to our attention in the 20th century and it came to attention for a reason, for all of these statistical measures that you've just uh, painted for us. 
And my hope would be that by the end of the 21st century, we no longer need to be fixated on gender as a category. But that would, that would only happen if people could actually achieve this in the same way, the same goals that they, uh, that they wanted to achieve, regardless of their uh, accident of birth. And f for the workplace at the moment, um, the fact that we are still having trouble allowing women to do what they're biologically capable of and what they're mentally and physically capable of as professionals seems to me like we have a long way to go in the 20, 21st century. Tim, Ross or, or Tony, <laughs> any comments on that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was just re reading something yesterday on the Gorilla Girls, um, a, a, an artist group that um, a very forceful um, be active in, in feminism and it says that um, uh, three percent of artists represented in the Met are female yet 83 percent of the works are of nude male um, females <laughs> um, and I think you know that these it's surprising that we can be dismissive of things like um, um, feminism or cultural issues yet they're still so relevant and and you know, exist just as equally as they, they ever have um, is just all I'm trying to say, I guess, that these things need to be addressed and readdressed and people need to be continuing to look at them within day-to-day um, you know, -day life. Now, we're fast running out of time. Do we have another, uh, another question from the audience uh, down the front here? Well, the microphone's getting to, uh, to this gentleman. Sure. I think it, I, I'd like to make an observation, and that is that as a futurist, people often ask, what is the future? And my answer is sometimes a little disappointing, and that is that, well, well what is the present? Uh, presents can be so different. It depends on where in the world you are. It depends on your gender, you know, uh, can it, it, pri privilege at birth. Uh, I mean, there are all sorts of in indicators that can influence what your present is like right now. And equally, there is no one because there is no one present, and you could be either building an iPhone 5 at Foxconn headquarters, or you could be salivating at the prospect of, of waiting up for 48 hours to buy the iPhone 5, your future, your presence is so different, and your futures are likely to be quite different as well. And so whilst I think it's fun to think about a future, um, it, there's actually multiple futures, and I think the question becomes, uh, I think the future is about the choices that we make, and so it becomes a question of, well, what, do, what kind of presence do we, do we notice that we'd like to see more of, and what do we want to see less of? And that's, I, I guess that, that brings out the activist in me. <laughs> All right, and that question. I don't have much of a segue for that, <laughs> um, but I wanted the t panel to perhaps touch on, uh, one of the tweets before was education, um, and the future of education, if perhaps everyone can go around and say, perhaps the biggest benefit they see of um, technology in the future in, in education, and perhaps the biggest risk we could face. Well, in a, it's, a, it's a big topic, and since this is a large part of our future, the <coughs> learning is about experience, so it's not about classrooms. I mean, it's a little bit about classrooms, but it's mainly about sharing experiences, learning from people by doing. So that experience, that engagement, whether it's technologically enabled or not, I think is absolutely critical. The, I think that there are massive potential benefits. But I, th I think the, the real point, though, is that education is critical, as in people's ability to learn de determines their livelihood, determines their future. We will all have to be working, if we are working in 10 years from now, quite doing quite different things than we have today. And we have to kind of learn to an immense amount if we're going to be able to uh, prosper in any way individually in a society. So this is, in a way, you know, the big issue, one of the massive issues which we haven't really discussed so far tonight. Um, Any other comments? I just don't believe it's within technology, it's within historical truth that our, where our education system needs to go. All right, uh, other comments? Well, just to build on some things said earlier, I, I think that one of the problems with the way that education, higher education I'm speaking of here, has adopted new media technology has been precisely in that slavish manner to platforms that I was describing happening in, in workplaces where uh, the opportunity for a university to have a Facebook page for its students um, and for uh, big corporations to make deals about software packages that then 
uh, make all of us academics have to put our lecture notes online and, and, and broadcast our lectures on MP3. All of these are requirements of the workplace uh, for us as academics and requirements and skills for students are really uh, capturing what I think is a really precious moment, the classroom encounter, which is one of those few encounters now that we have to have a human uh, relationship and an emotional and, and an inspiring relationship with our students. So I think in terms of the future, one of the most radical things that educationalists could do right now would be to make their classrooms technology-free zones because that would actually uh, reanimate some excitement about ideas and, and the capacity to communicate in person. Which comes back to that idea again, doesn't it, of, of technology sometimes becoming a distraction, uh, even though we we think it's often the answer, you know, that, that, that idea almost of the, the IT solution. There'll always the, be, the thing I have in always mind be an there, IT solution. Yeah, the thing I have in mind there is um, a campaign I saw on, on the university campus at the start of last year where, where BlackBerry marketing had, had featured on a range of notice boards around campus. Um, you might remember this campaign, the Love What You Do campaign, which is how BlackBerry sold uh, its devices over the last uh, 18 months or so. And, and there was a love shack at the university where, where O-Week kids were, were encouraged to go and sign up for BlackBerry plans, as if this was part of what university life involved, you know, getting a smartphone and, and becoming professional in this way. And it, it really horrified me that that's, uh, that's the extent to which uh, corporate uh, reach has, has taken hold, yeah. Uh, Tim, any thoughts just before we go to final questions? Yeah, on education, uh, I think it's uh, it's not it's less about content and more about capacity, capacity to learn over a lifetime, and I think given time frames, I'll leave it at that. Okay, we're, we're almost out of time. Just uh, time for a couple of, of quick questions. I have to be short in terms of the answer. Uh, Melissa, let's start with you. Um, in terms of technology, I mean, we've, we've talked a lot about it, but it really, it's there. I mean, it's getting, it's getting more and more difficult to operate in the world without engaging with technology, whether it's, whether it's buying a, a ticket for the theatre, um, you know, or even paying your bills, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, are we, is there a worry, though, that we, that we could be getting to a stage where there's almost a, a two-tier society, where we have people who, for whatever reason, for various reasons, can't engage in that way, and then other people who are doing very nicely, thank you, they're dealing with this technological change. Yeah, I think what you're talking about there is, is absolutely a set of questions about comfort levels and the rate of change. Um, and I think what we do have as a really exciting opportunity at the moment, um, the, the research that I've been doing in the, the last few months is in uh, one of the first release sites for the National Broadband Network. And this to me seems like one of the great ideas that, that is still yet to take, uh, to take full effect in this country at addressing some of those imbalances. And it's a really rare opportunity that I'm looking forward to seeing uh, take place because it will actually allow us to see if it's possible to change some of the metrocentric ideas about technology rollout that are really creating new kinds of divides in our society. Uh, Tony Albert, um, ownership and authorship they're concepts that increasingly, uh, as this century goes on, seem to be becoming much more fluid. And we know with the music industry particularly, it's become a big issue for artists uh, as to uh, you know, how they feel about their, their work not only being downloaded for free, but being used by other people, by being, uh, you know, being modified by other people. Uh, as a as a visual artist, I mean, what's your feeling on this? Is that is that an issue that resonates with you? Um, you know, I kind of have a feeling once someone something leaves the studio, I have no control then over it, or I try to minimise what I, um, you know, do and don't have control over. So, you know, if it's a clear no-brainer, then it, it want, once people have access to it, then you know, really they can do what they want with it. But it is incredibly problematic and. I think this um, is a really important issue within Indigenous communities and our idea of what ownership means and that having community ownership over something rather than an individual um, owning it as well or if someone recounts a story and then publishes it, it becomes theirs and um, I mean it's in, um, an incredibly difficult um, I guess um, way of looking and there, there's there's elements sorry I'm going on on elements um, to it that need to be um, 
uh, looked at within that. But um, you know, from my own personal point of view, I think um, you know I, I reuse and appropriated images myself. But it's be because they're being appropriated, the meaning exists. So um, you know, good it's artists. A good area. Yeah. Good artists copy, great artists steal, Picasso said. Uh, Ross Dawson, <laughs> uh, um, the game show question, I guess. I mean, ag agree or disagree with the following uh, statement. Uh, the gene geneticist Francis Collins once said that we tend to overestimate the short-term impact of technology and underestimate the long-term impact. True? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you would also add... <laughs> uh, well, that we forget the past, and as I, I think I said at the beginning, we forget how quickly things change. And I think when we look into the future, we do. Uh, if we look, say, looking at a space of a decade, for example, I think very few people have any idea how dramatically different things will be. Uh, so I think we forget how quickly things have passed, and we, we, we I think we uh, have very little insight into how quickly things will change. Um, and Tim, last question. I mean, picking up <coughs> on that point, uh, a, a short-term focus. We hear we hear that a lot in politics, a criticism of politics, particularly, uh, but also of, of corporations of late of the last couple of decades. Does having that sort of short-term focus <coughs> and does that make it harder for us to to positively impact on the future, on our future? Yes, and uh, and what I would say to that is that the that what we've seen consistently over over the years is that build that organizations that have built with built a capacity for foresight into their businesses have a bigger opportunity or a bigger possibility of actually uh, taking advantage of uh, noticing opportunities and taking advantage of them in fact that's my mantra when I go into an organization I ask them what is how what explain to me your capacity for foresight everyone can acknowledge the world's changing so fast people I've, I've had one woman said to me I feel like the world's spinning so fast I feel like I'm about to be flung off and so given that organizations consistently acknowledge and boardrooms consistently acknowledge the, the, um, what feels like an accelerating rate of change, so when I turn to, a, to a, um, you know, people in a position of authority and power within a business and say, so explain to me your capacity for foresight, and I met with you know, stunning silence, then, I, then I, I smell an opportunity because basically um, <laughs> we, need, we need to put ourselves in a position where we're at least... Uh, looking at how the world is changing socially, technologically, economically, environmentally, politically, doing the pattern recognition, identifying the signals in the noise, and ultimately being a futurist is about asking two questions. And the first is, what's going on out there? And the second, what are the possibilities? All right, look, thank you for that. Well, that's where we'll have to leave it uh, for today. Uh, thanks to our panellists, to Tony Albert, a Brisbane-based artist, to Tim Longhurst from the global strategy and communication consultancy Key Message, Ross Dorts, Dawson, a futurist and founding chairman of the research and strategy firm Future Exploration Network, and Dr Melissa Gregg, a senior lecturer in the Department of Gender and Cultural Studies at the University of Sydney. Uh, please join me in giving them a round of applause. And... Special thanks to all of you and to the people watching via the live webcast. Thank you for, for turning up, for attending, and also for engaging with us uh, here at the Gallery of Modern Art in Brisbane. Uh, I'm Anthony Fennell. Thank you very much. Have a, have a nice night. Bye for now.